Hello, everyone. Hi. Hiya. Um, it would be great um, if everyone, apart from the speakers, could um, mute themselves. So we are recording the session um, and then we could share it with those who are not able to attend today. We are just allowing some time for people to join us. We still have some people waiting in the room to get connected. If I could ask you to put yourself on mute so we don't have any background noises and then um, we can start officially. Um, my name is Justina Sobotka, I'm Project Officer at Healthy London Partnership and I will facilitate this meeting um, today for us. We've got amazing speakers planned um, for today, so we'll hear from uh, Be Becky Gore and Heidi uh, Reedsdale uh, from UCLH and Camden Integrated Adult Services. We have Claire Kennedy, who is a Clinical Networks Program Manager. We have our lovely Diana Norris, Social Prescribing Link Worker from Bromley uh, GP Alliance. Um, and as a, as a last speaker, we'll have Rebecca Manson-Johns, um, who is a founder of an organization called Spare Tire, um, who runs COVID cafes for people suffering, um, struggling with um, long COVID. Um, I would like to um, make sure that we all here are aware of um, the fact that um, we can treat this space as confidential. Um, the parts um, that you can see from two o'clock will not be recorded, so you can share your experiences, your struggles, your challenges or best practices, um, and that will stay within, within um, us here today. Feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself. It would be nice to hear where are you based, how long you are in post, um, and if you have any questions, please use the chat function as well. Um, Liana will be here to um, um, either provide some quick answers or then uh, we'll have Q&A sessions with our guests, uh, guest speakers to answer all of the questions that you may have. If we are not able to answer all of your questions today, we'll do an additional document um, that will be then circulated to make sure that, um, that your question um, is answered. Uh, if you have to leave early for whatever reasons, then obviously that's fine. We do understand that um, working as social prescribing link worker uh, is a very demanding role and sometimes it's not possible to to dedicate um the full um the full one hour and a half to this meeting however we highly encourage that you stay um if you if you can it's always nice to um to have you here and when we speak um in the section from two o'clock it would be nice if you have your cameras on so uh, we can see who we are speaking to um so um i would like to invite now um becky gore and heidi um to tell us something more about long COVID. um can i have the next slide please becky are you there I am here. Is everyone able to hear me? Yes. Lovely. <laughs> Perfect. Next slide, please. Uh, cool. Lovely. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, my name's Becky. I am um, one of the physios um, working at in the post-COVID team um, at uh, UCLH. Um, so, yeah, here to talk a bit about long COVID, to hopefully cover a bit about what long COVID is, um, some of the basic signs and symptoms. Um, some questions that you might ask if you thought someone might be perhaps struggling with long COVID just to explore. Um, how long COVID is then impacting patients and what we commonly see and how they present. And then um, some of the very basic rehab principles um, that we um, give to patients when they come and see us. I can I have the next slide please? Thank you. Um, so yeah, long COVID. So we know that long COVID affects 
um, approximately 1.7 million or 2.7 percent of the uh, UK population um, and it is most um, most prevalent in women um, between the ages of uh, 39 and 45, uh, 35 and 49 years, um, living in um, the most deprived areas, working in kind of teaching, education um, and health and social care, um, and also those with other kind of limiting um, health conditions. There's no connection between um, the severity of uh, someone's initial illness um, and therefore long COVID can affect those who are both hospitalised or perhaps had uh, minor symptoms in the community. And I'm sure you've all heard the word kind of long COVID or post COVID um, and they're all slightly interchangeable. Um, just, yeah, we all kind of refer to the similar things. Um, next slide, thank you. So um, we know that most people um, might have COVID and then start to feel better within a few weeks. However, this isn't the case for everyone and some take longer to recover. Um, so having had symptoms of long COVID for approximately kind of three months or 12 weeks um, after the initial illness, there's uh, no alternative diagnosis. Um, and symptoms can be um, new following the kind of the initial recovery or they can be um, a prolonging of the persistent illness. Symptoms are genuinely, genuinely, uh, generally kind of fluctuate with time um, and patients can relapse. Um, and long COVID is an emerging condition um, and we don't know the exact theory behind it um, or kind of what's still causing it. So what are some of the common signs and symptoms? Um, so we know that long COVID impacts um, patients' uh, everyday functioning and it affects and uh, negatively affects kind of their well-being and their ability to exercise and to work. So there are kind of about 200 possible symptoms and these can cover the whole body. And um, there's no diagnostic test, um, but this is kind of diagnosis is based kind of when the doctor sees them based on their clinical judgment, um, their kind of history and how they might present. So obviously if um, you were concerned that someone might be struggling with long COVID, we really um, encourage you to tell people to kind of go to their GPs and to make sure that they seek um, medical help. So fatigue is one of the most common symptoms that we see with patients with long COVID. Um, and on top of the fatigue, they also um, quite often present with these um, with these crashes so it's kind of this exacerbation of this then this fatigue um, if they do too much and the fatigue isn't just kind of our normal tiredness but it's this severe exhaustion or kind of total body shutdown and um, it's not really relieved by the normal sleep or rest um, and it can be really easily exacerbated by um, doing too much whether that's kind of physical activities or thinking activities or emotional overload and um, and some of these activities might be things that patients have taken for granted before so you know having a shower or walking around the park or seeing a friend um, but now they really struggle to do them so we really commonly see patients in cycles of what we say boom and bust with this fluctuating symptoms where they have periods where their energy might be a bit better. But then if they overdo it, this is where um, they crash and their fatigue gets worse again. Um, breathlessness is a really another common symptom um, and this can be at rest or it can be on minimal exertion. Again, walking a short distances or perhaps talking on the phone. Um, muscle and joint aches and pains. Again, these can be constant or can be quite closely linked with um, the fatigue um, and therefore can get worse on a small activity. Um, I'm sure lots of you heard people struggle with brain fog. So thinking about reduced memory, taking longer to process information, um, struggling to find words or not being able to concentrate. Ongoing cough. Um, changes in smell or taste and this can be having like no, none at all or it could be distortion so people might think um, something normal to them like chocolate might end up smelling something horrible like petrol so it's all kind of got mixed up within the brain. There are lots of links or changes with like anxiety and depression um, and patients often have disturbed sleep or poor sleep whether this is getting later to get to sleep um, their sleep might be disturbed and we commonly see patients waking up feeling really unrefreshed. They haven't slept well at all. Next slide, please.
Um, so if you were kind of seeing someone and you thought that they might um, might be struggling with symptoms and you wanted to explore this a bit more, what are the common questions that you might ask someone? Um, so obviously the first one is whether they have had COVID and when they think they had it. Um, and did their symptoms start following this? Um, you might ask them if they what their main symptoms are and are they experiencing a lot of the classic ones that we see and this includes things like the brain fog or the breathlessness um, or fatigue and chest pain. You might ask them if their symptoms get better or worse after doing an activity um, so linking back to that cycle of boom and bust when their fatigue is worse if they do too much. Are their symptoms overall getting better or worse? So thinking about that kind of a longer term trend. Um, have they spoken to a GP or any healthcare professional about their symptoms or have they found any other support to help manage and treat their symptoms? Um, and once again, if you have any concerns, please encourage patients to see their GP or kind of seek further medical help. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to kind of talk a bit about um, how a patient might present. Um, so once again, when we're thinking about this, we're talking about patients who are both hospitalised and those who are treated in um, the community um, and have perhaps had minor symptoms. Um, and it, people might think that, oh, if they've been hospitalised, they kind of are already in the system, they're more likely to be picked up. Um, but I think it's really important that we kind of still follow them up to make sure that they continue to get the support throughout their whole journey. Um, so when we are going to talk about the long COVID patients and how we might see them and therefore thinking about how those signs and symptoms we just described might then impact someone's um, daily life. So patients might present with reduced mobility. So thinking about the fatigue, the breathlessness, their aches and pains, um, and some might have had long hospital stays or they might have been in um, ITU, also intensive care, um, and therefore they're struggling to get out and access the community. Um, they might struggle to get their kind of get food or other shopping and groceries, um, or they might be limited in being able to see friends and socialise. So especially for people who live on their own, this can increase kind of loneliness and isolation. Um, in some cases, they might rely more on um, family to help support them at home, whether this is things like cooking or more extreme cases, it might be um, needing support with things like washing and dressing. Um, so financial and kind of work concerns are really, really big. So I think it's estimated that approximately two thirds of patients with long COVID aren't able to return to work on a full time basis. Um, so with work, we're thinking about kind of brain fog again, fatigue, breathlessness, the aches and pains, headaches, um, a whole cocktail of things. Um, so a lot of them might have uh, quite a lot of pressure from work um, to return. So they might return too soon or a phased return to work might be um, not be appropriate and too short. Um, and these this kind of added stress can make a lot of their symptoms work. They might miss quite a lot of work due to illness um, or when they are at work, perhaps they struggle with the brain fog so their productivity isn't as good. Um, and we know that obviously work is so important for people because it's their only way to get money and therefore support their families. So they don't really see any other way that for them, they might have to go to work and then they just can't do anything outside of work because this is where they're so limited. Um, so some patients as well say that they might um, be looking at uh, other kind of support. Um, so things like PIP forms to try and get some extra um, extra way of getting some compensation or some, some support from that point of view. But often these forms are really, really lengthy and they require lots of information and records um, and therefore they're challenging in themselves to complete. Again, if someone's got brain fog, this is just um, might seem too much for them to do. Um, so they can't really access um, any other benefits from that way. Um, fatigue. So one area of the fatigue that we might not think about quite so much is the sensory and the environmental overload. So say someone goes to work, but they have to get the tube every morning 
um, and we've all I'm sure been on the underground um, at rush hour and there's lots of people, there's lots of noise and um, it's really busy and congested, people are running around um, and this can lead to kind of this sensory overwhelm um, and therefore you know they might be able not be able to take public transport to work um, or for others this might limit uh, social interactions um, and therefore people going out and socialising with friends um, as we know that as kind of the UK starts to return to um, a bit more normal and things are opening up more, you know, crowds are, are getting bigger. And again, this can link into the same um, feelings of uh, overwhelm. Um, so we've spoken a bit about brain fog and how it can impact people's ability to work and um, can struggle with kind of reduced memory. Um, and this can be on a kind of a small scale where perhaps someone is forgetting a few things in a conversation or they might forget a few things on a list at a supermarket but we also have some more extreme um extreme ends of the scale where patients report that they um forget to turn um the hob or the oven off and they're putting themselves at risk or they might have to you know set reminders because otherwise they forget to go and pick the children up from school and then lastly um thinking about the psychological impact um so we've got things like the post-traumatic stress disorder, which might um, affect those who were in intensive care. But also people at home who, especially when um, in March 2020, where um, patients might have had really frightening symptoms, but were absolutely petrified of going into hospital and therefore struggled at, um, alone at home or thinking about the depression and the anxiety. Um, and this can add quite a lot of strain on people's um, family systems um, and as we especially see in kind of certain groups that patients don't want to confine or talk to their families about how they're feeling as they don't want to um, be an added burden on them as well. We see common themes around frustration um, and the unknown as patients don't really know um, when they're going to get better or their symptoms can be so unpredictable that they feel that they just can't plan, um, you know, for the weekend or the future because they just don't know how they're going to be. Um, and then lastly, thinking about like loss of sense of um, themselves. So changes in kind of role or identity. Um, so if we have perhaps have a mother who's really struggling with fatigue or muscle aches, they might um, feel that they can't really pick their child up to give them to a hug or they can't take them to the park and then, run around a park um, and therefore this can change how they feel um, as a mother and a parent. So a lot of these all link into people's kind of effects on people's relationships, whether we're thinking with work colleagues, with friends, with families, or perhaps um, with their partners. Um, next slide, please. Um, so lastly, what do we um, say to our patients when they're kind of when they come with us um, from both kind of when we're in our assessment clinics or um, if they're being treated in the community as well for further support? Um, what is some of the basic stuff that we might give them? So we know that there unfortunately is no magic cure um, or there's no pill that we can give to our long COVID patients to kind of help them get better. Um, but we know that safe and effective rehab is really, really important for patients' recovery. Um, and this needs to be kind of individualised and um, tailored to each person's kind of goals and needs. Um, so these are some of the kind of the key principles and the foundations um, that we will give to patients. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of stop, rest and pace. So this encourages patients to stop um, and to not push through their limits um, as overexertion might kind of cause more harm to their recovery. Um, we tell patients to rest, um, which is really important for their management and to rest before their symptoms come on um, and to pace both their daily activity, but it's physical stuff, but also pace kind of the thinking activities, the pace when they're at work as well. We get patients to learn about what their um, what their energy levels are um, and to modify and reduce activities in order for them to be able to kind of conserve their energy and to prevent them kind of crushing or using up all their energy in the first few hours of the day. Um, we also really like the four P's so we get patients to prioritize. So what are their main things they have to achieve that day and each week? Um, and then that get them to plan. So plan those tasks with periods of rest in between. 
we get them to pace. So taking those tasks, we get them to break them up into smaller chunks so they can add the rest in between. And then lastly, and really commonly missed is pleasure. So we want to make sure that people still have things that they enjoy in life um, and activities that they might be able to do in a slightly modified way, but really improve their quality of their life. Um, when we talk about rest, as we've mentioned a lot as well, we make sure it's really good quality rest. Um, patients might say, oh, but I sit on the sofa and I watch telly all day, but that's not rest for their brain. So we get them to think of reducing the mental stimulation, um, so thinking about rest for the mind and the body. So doing kind of breathing exercises or meditation um, and having just kind of short breaks throughout the day. Um, and lastly, and one of the most hardest points is educating and encouraging patients to learn how and when to say no so that they can put themselves first, so they can look after themselves before they give to others. And therefore this links really nicely with encouraging patients to ask for help when they need it, whether this is kind of from a GP or healthcare professionals, um, family, friends, um, charities or other sports um, so that patients realise that they are not alone in their journey. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Becky, um, for this um, summary about long COVID. Do we have any questions um, from link workers around um, long COVID as, as an illness? If anyone wants to um, ask a question, please feel free to do so. You just need to unmute yourself first and then ask a question. Um, yeah. Hi, Kai, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Elizabeth here. Um, one of the concerns that I have about long COVID it comes from patients and uh, it's about the interactions they sometimes have with GPs. So, uh, well, long COVID means um, multiple problems, basically. And the issue is when they see their GP and they want to talk about everything they're going through, that most of the time is not possible because the GP only has time to address one problem at a time. Yeah, that's right. And that causes a lot of pain and frustration. It really doesn't help people emotionally because they feel that they need to talk about everything. So how is it, how are GPs meant to really identify if the problems that are being brought to them are long COVID, if they don't have time to listen to everything this person has, has to describe? And uh, so I, I just don't really know what to think about that because, or what to say to patients, because they clearly say, before COVID, I was very healthy, but since I had COVID, I'm having this and this and this and that problem, and I can't talk to the GP about all of it because there's only time for one problem at a time. How is that going to be addressed in primary care? Um, hi, Becky, do you want me to come in on that question with a community head on? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Heidi. Um, so, hi. Um, I'm sorry I was late to the meeting. I um, missed the link in my emails. Um, I'm Heidi Ridsdale. I have worked with um, Becky in the UCLH post-COVID clinic and I um, am co-lead for a um, COVID rehab team in, in Camden. Um, so, you're absolutely right. Um, it is a real challenge, isn't it? Because COVID comes with so many different aspects in terms of the physical, mental and, and emotional um, sort of burden of, 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 of having COVID. Um, I think um, there, are gui there is guidance um, and certainly um, speaking from a North Central London point of view, which is where um, Becky and I work, there's, there's GP guidance that's being developed um, and, and also um, training put, put in place um, to help support GPs and, and, and other people in primary care to, to, under, to sort of see 
and screen for long COVID, just like we're having the conversation here and um, having the same conversations at, in the primary care level. There's also um, uh, been some um, modules developed um, on, um, I think, uh, Health Education England website, and they have um, got some points associated with them. So they're CPD development points. So um, GPs um, can, can, can do those trainings. Um, but it's, it's, it's still a problem, and I, and I hear it's still a problem, that the awareness of long COVID in the public the awareness of long COVID in primary care is, is still challenging um, and, and we haven't got all the solutions yet. Um, but I think, um, you know, the first step is, 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 is people being, um, it's, 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 it's screening them, is, you know, public awareness, being able to go to the, the, the GPs. Um, and um, I think with time, we will see a better um, knowledge and understanding of long COVID, but um, we, we aren't at the end of that journey. Can I add to that from a um, regional perspective, national perspective, is we're very aware that what we're hearing is patients aren't being able to get into services because they're struggling to get past their GP and in order to get into services, you need a referral from your GP. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation and you can't really get the help you need. So we were hearing a lot of that. There was a, for the last sort of financial year, there was support for GPs that provided them for extra funding to do those extra long appointments, but it wasn't well utilized and it has now been withdrawn for the next financial year. But what we are doing, um, one of the people who work with us is a GP. So one of the team are a GP and they, um, passion if you want to say is trying to get that agreement and understanding from an, a GP's perspective how do you how can we support GPs to listen and hear and and get the time that they need because one of the things that we hear from patients is it's very important that patients actually um recover or, or get heard and that gives a lot of reassurance the fact that it's a valid diagnosis of valid condition. So we're trying to take it up um, to national level and say, you know, we need to work alongside our GPs because they're they're the barrier at the moment for people getting care. In the meantime, what I would suggest is we're going to have a little bit of time at two o'clock to have a really sort of fruitful, hopefully fruitful conversation about how do we work together, how do clinicians, social prescribers and primary care generally work together? How do we get um, support to patients outside of um, the NHS structures as such? And um, I know one service is trialing a self-referral form, but maybe there's something about us working together. If you're talking to patients who are, you know, giving you the frustration, how do we use the social prescriber as an almost like advocate for the patient to get that support in place, whether it's advocating to the GP or advocating to the service. And any, any, so everything that happens in long COVID at the moment comes from the ground up. We don't have any grand, grand ideas about what we need to do because it's all kind of new and difficult to manage. So what you guys have to do to, what you think are ideas or you think would be helpful or what you're willing to do as a social prescriber to support this group of patients, we can then take and, and try and work through at a higher level to get that actually implemented and actually supported. Because I think we are struggling with patients not getting in the front door in the first place. Thank you, Claire, for, for sharing this. Um, I think that it would be a good moment, Claire, if, you, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about resources that you provide patients with during your clinic's appointments. Um, that would be really helpful for social prescribers to know what resources are officially you know, recommended and how you actually encourage your patients to use the, this resources, because we know that it can be difficult to motivate people to access um, what is provided to them. Um, how do you work in your clinics to make sure that patients get this um, right way? 
so I think that there's a couple of it's very difficult to um you have to you have to take a what matters to you approach with the patient and I think your social subscriber is probably um I'm telling you what you already know um the important thing about working with patients is they are overwhelmed by a lot of things so their anxiety their breathlessness their fatigue their stress it all comes into a vicious circle and gets worse and worse and worse and it's about say if you took all of it aside and say what's the most important to, thing for you to change today if you were to leave here changing one thing what would that one thing be and trying to get their buy-in about using you know motivational interviewing techniques so that they start to say well I want to change my fatigue or I want to change my breathlessness and I think this is the most important thing um that that is it the most important thing for me right now um in order to do that I think the one thing that um I've got another list of an extra list of resources that I'll send to Justina to um, send around but I think that often what we're finding is patients are really motivated to do stuff so they want to do you know their fatigue management and they want to do their breathlessness exercises and they they want to change how they are currently functioning they don't want to live this life they want to get back to the things that are important to them but it's the practicality it's, it's like if i took them out and put them into an ideal world into an ideal paradise where they didn't have to have you know a job and financial strain and children to care for and parents with um you know their own comorbidities and health issues or friends with unrealistic expectations if i could take them out of those situations and put them into an, a little bubble and tell them right all you have to do is do your exercise and pace yourself they would recover it's the stuff that life that is important to them that you can't say no to you can't tell your two-year-old child like actually no this i need eight hours of sleep so you can't be waking up and you know in the middle of the night and you can't be um requiring all my attention and i can't play with you in the park and because a two-year-old doesn't understand that so i think this is where social prescribers are so key and why we want to work and link in and work more effectively together is because you understand what's in the community that can help people practically so is there a financial aid support or is there some way some way that they can get some practical support with things like housework and um, so like you know a lot of parents say they want to play with their children but they can't do all of it so which part of it can we give them assistance to do so that that they then have the energy in order to do the other stuff and i think that once people start to have that space and that time of being able to practically implement something because some of the burden of life stress has been taken away then you start to see the changes that people are able to implement but it's quite difficult to say to someone you have to keep do you have to keep going to work and you have to keep looking after your family and you have to keep your house on top of things and you have to keep cooking your meals but you also have to stop doing a whole bunch of things and put in rest periods because it all becomes too overwhelming and all too stressful so i think that is it's really like you know starting with the patient what's next what's important to them what do they want to change and how can we help them practically to get there um and that's where you know I, i'm not gonna you you your that's your work and your expertise as social prescribers and link workers is doing that um opportunity and um, the important thing i would say is about trying to work very flexibly with patients um and trying to understand some of the stresses with regards especially to work so a lot of our patients are in that working age bracket they they're at the working age bracket and young families that's our big sort of patient group but um the working age bracket is somewhere to help them to understand what they're entitled to and to get some support in order to um, make sure that they are able to get that work do their work that they want to do so there's something called reasonable adjustments and it's in the law it's someone cannot be fired for having post-covid syndrome or long covid it's an, classified as a disability and their um employer is 
uh, expected to make some adjustments in which are practical and reasonable within the company. So if it's a small company, you know, one man show and they rely on this person to do basically everything, there are, it's quite difficult to say, oh, well, that company needs to change their whole processes and policies and allow this person to work, you know, a third of the time that they can or that they're employed for. But if they put, this person works for like, you know, for example, have, um, one of our big biggest groups of patient people that are struggling are NHS employees and teachers. And if they are working for an NHS employer or a teaching, um, you know, a, a school education facility, there are there are that they're big enough organisations that they are actually um, expected and under law need to make reasonable adjustments for this person to continue working in a way that is effective for them and promotes their health and recovery. So the ACAS, I can't remember what they stand for, but they are a good, um, it's a good website, but basically just outlines exactly what a reasonable adjustment may be. Um, Remploy is a company, it's a charity, I think, that actually support people in getting back to work. Um, and there is one more that has just flown out of my mind where if you were looking for advice or guidance, you're able to phone them, explain your work situation and get advice and guidance as to what you should do going forwards. Um, but it should not be the case of just either you come to work full time or you are fired um, because then there is a strong case that you could take them to court. Um, so we have the other thing is that we have with our population of patients is um, because they're often in caring industries or just their sort of nature is that they don't want to go back to the same no thing. They don't want to say no to the employer. They don't want other people to think that they're unable to do things. So it's really helpful to get them to help support them to take on that it's not a weakness asking for support and guidance it's a strength so that they can return to work full-time or they may make themselves even more unwell in the future um, so those are a couple of sort of the key things um, that I think are important to patient to to get across to patients Unless uh, I'm, I'm open to Heidi and Rebecca, if there's anything just additional that they have to add. Heidi, Rebecca, do you have anything to add to what Claire said? Um, not. I, I guess. Um, I mean, you know, it is it is really challenging with the with the patient demographic, which is something that. Um, most of us are not used to dealing with, but most of us deal, and, and this might, when I say we, this might not be um, you guys from social prescribing point of view, because you probably see a range of patients, but um, it's, you know, normally a lot of the most of our caseload is people with long-term conditions, so it's slightly different demographics, so a lot of this is all new, um, and, 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 and as Claire's illustrated, you know, as fast is, is moving, things are happening, things are changing, um so you know it, it is trying to keep up with some of the information as well is quite hard to do um but you know obviously you you have a network and you link in together so you know finding ways to share information um if you see something come up and out would be really useful to to look at how you do that as a as a social um as a as a, net, as a network as a group of people and the only other thing that i wanted to just add in was um just the question about whether somebody has to have had a positive COVID test for them to um, be assessed and diagnosed with, with COVID. Um, and that's been challenging the past and is likely to be challenging going forward. In the past, at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was no testing available and going forward now, when testing is going to be less and less sort of mandated and less and less available. So and, 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 you know, people are going to be using their own lateral flow device tests. So, um, um, so, so the answer in a nutshell is no. <laughs> um, but what is really clear is, is, is some of those questions that um, Becky alluded to in her presentation, which is about um, having a clear um, 
a period of acute illness with what sounds like COVID-like symptoms um, and um, that some of that patterning that um, Becky illustrated and talked about, you know, in terms of the way it looks and changes and moves and the actual symptoms themselves, um, you know, does it does it sound and feel like um, it meet, it meet, you know it, it it looks like um, long COVID in terms of that? So so in a in a nutshell, they don't people don't have to have had a positive test, a PCR test for um, being able to be diagnosed with with long COVID. Thank you so much, Heidi. I had a um, long time to say that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you, for, thank you for sharing that. I think this is very important information um, because there's a lot of misconceptions around this um, uh, between our patients. And um, Liana, do we have anything in the chat that is worth mentioning at that point? I've actually been kicked out of the meeting a couple of times, so I don't have any of the chat. There was somebody that, some, that I did catch that somebody mentioned that they have recruited a project social prescribing link worker um, and are doing some of the proactive finding of particular patients. And um, they've been yeah identifying cohorts of long COVID patients. I think Jenny also talked about <clears throat> Jenny talk, Jenny mentioned something so Jen, Jenny's a, a member of our team who works alongside so I've just seen as supporting some of the workforce <clears throat> working uh, the, the three roles uh, personalized care roles social prescribing link workers Jenny actually works with care coordinators and health and well-being coaches and runs the network for care coordinators and I think um, when you if someone was talking about advocacy for patients that's very much you know that would often sit within the care coordinator role and I know that primary care at the moment are trying to work out um, what care what the superpowers of the care coordinator are and how they should be better used so I think there's there's a couple of examples there um, I don't know if we want to go into them in more detail or if it's better to pick up at two I think it would be nice to hear in um, our experiences and challenges section afterwards. So, uh, people mentioned by Liana, if you if you'd like to um, share your examples, um, that would be a possibility there um, to to actually share them and have more in depth discussion about how we can learn from your best practice. Um, and now, if I could ask Diana Norris, a social prescribing link worker from Bromley. Um, GP Alliance to um, say something about how their approach to long COVID um, is within within social prescribing service. Diana, um. can I have the other? There was like a first slide, wasn't there? Hi, everybody. Can I have the you know with the bubbles? <laughs> I think that's my second slide, isn't it? I had one with them. Um, Liana, could you swap the slides? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, so hi everybody. So I lead a team of social prescribing link workers working across Bromley. And um, the source material for what I'm going to share with you today has come from two places. It's partly the work that we do, that we're doing with patients and patients who have been referred to us. And it's also from an event which I attended, um, which was hosted by London South Bank University, where they invited, uh, it was just a Bromley based event, but they're doing it across London, um, where they invited patients and community based services and GPs and social prescribers, everybody basically who might be involved in some way in providing support for people with long COVID. So I'm pulling these ideas from, from two places. So I think as um, what Becky and Claire have talked about already, for me shows that Actually, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the experience that people with long COVID are having to what other people with long-term conditions experience. Um, in that there are a lot of different physical symptoms that are happening at the same time. And then there's an awful lot of um, emotional, psychological issues associated with having a long-term condition. And then obviously the, the practical problems. So the kind of things that we've been supporting our patients with are as I think Becky mentioned a lot of these, but they are usual, the typical sort of issues that patients would come to us in social prescribing, having problems with. So low mood and anxiety, financial concerns, um, difficulty sleeping, um, needing support to remain independent at home, needing support with housing, that kind of thing, and also wanting some support with self-care. So from our point of view, we haven't really seen anything 
different in terms of the social prescribing needs of people with long COVID. So having a long-term condition, whether it's fibromyalgia or diabetes or arthritis or heart failure, or any of those conditions, in the same way as long COVID, it makes you feel isolated because your lived experience is very different from other people's lived experiences. It's a condition a little bit like fibromyalgia, I think long-term COVID where it doesn't always show and people aren't aware of what you're suffering. So that's a common theme that's come through for people. It's, it's um, people are finding that they, they have no experience of the benefits system or how to access care, those kind of things. So our usual social prescribing services in Bromley have been really helpful for us. So we've, we've got um, lo lots of good services locally. We're very fortunate actually that our mind, um, Age UK, people like that have a lot of good services that we can send people to. There are some differences um, which have been quite quite interesting actually. Can we go to the next, can I go to the next slide? <laughs> that would be probably the- Oh no, maybe yes, it's the, the previous, previous one, yeah. Mm, no, the one that we're not, yeah, the maybe, yeah, that one. Um, yeah, so at this event, the event that we had where we had the, the patients and all the, and all the support workers, that was really useful um, because what came out of that is that social prescribing often hadn't been offered to them. So it was really interesting and kind of concerning for me. So I had a mixture of patients there, some of whom had seen my team, team members um, and were very pleased to have seen their team members and had got lots of support and others who had not heard yet of social prescribing. My personal take on that is that when Becky put up that slide of all those bewildering um, array of physical symptoms, and then we had that first question from that lady that said the problem for people is they can't, they haven't got enough GP time. I think what's happening with GPs is there's so much to talk about in terms of it being a new condition with all these different physical symptoms that it just, the social prescribing part gets lost. So we've done some work um, recently and actually us being invited to be, to take part in this event from London South Bank University was useful because I did do some work reaching out to GPs across Bromley and encouraging them to not forget us in in their long term long COVID pathways. So just you know, if you don't have time, that GPs don't have time to talk about what social prescribing is. Never mind. Just please, just at least mention it. At least suggest that the patients get an appointment with us because we just that's definitely been an issue for us in Bromley that we haven't got to these patients. But when we have got to them, it's been really useful. So we've done some work with sending out case studies to GPs, that kind of thing, just basically getting the word out. The other challenge that we've had um, in, in Bromley is that was obviously these pathways are still being devised um, and we are part of, of, of that now, which is good, we're part of that process. Um, but it's meant that some of the services are a little bit patchy and there's not a lot of support, of peer support at the moment. So what? So I've worked in long with long-term conditions for some time and people with long-term conditions find peer support so, so helpful. And there just didn't seem to be very much. So I'm very excited to hear about the cafes, um, the, the, the um, support cafes coming up later. But that's something that I, yeah. So one of these services in Bromley was actually supposed to be trying to recruit a long COVID support worker. And they went out to recruit twice and didn't get anybody. So that's a challenge for us. But what I'm thinking is that it's also an opportunity, which is why I've put that lower down in my, in my slide, because my team are increasingly getting involved in in setting up things in the community where there are gaps and you know we have definitely got a gap in this peer support so I think we will be thinking we are thinking um, about how we can have a role in establishing some peer support for long covid um, people living with long covid so I think be really helpful and then the other thing I've put there is about we have a role in listening to stories and sharing learning because the other key takeaway from me from this event I did with London South Bank University was they just need to tell that story. They just, because they were ill during the lockdown and their ability to sort of meet with people and, and talk about what happened to them was so limited. I just, I just felt with all the patients there, just having the chance to talk, just to talk really and just explain what they'd been through was so valuable. And that is something, I think that the first question where she said again about that, that piece about GPs not having time, we do have time as social prescribers. And I'm always saying to my team, don't underestimate the value that just a little bit of time can, can be, you know, even if there isn't a service to connect to, just you actually listening can be so helpful. And that was, it was very moving actually in that thing because they just were so grateful to have that. 
so yeah don't underestimate what what you can what you can do in that way um and yeah and then sharing the learning so I think you know taking that back because that that ability for us to listen and then we've got that information and we can share that in PCN meetings and that and that sort of thing so I suppose my message to social prescribers would be don't be concerned about the fact that long COVID is a new condition and it's not fully understood because in terms of our role and where we can have a difference it's very similar to existing long-term conditions so this is nothing new for you I think you can still add value in all the ways you do already so don't be kind of scared and think oh I don't understand it really I might not be able to help them you can you totally can um and yeah and, and look at it look at it as an opportunity and uh yeah don't underestimate I'm trying to read the chat at the same time I don't normally do that I need to not do that I'm like <laughs> it's putting me off but yeah so it is an opportunity and I think I think we have a real role to play that's probably my 10 minutes Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. That was really moving. You've mentioned the uh, London South Bank um, University um, uh, co long COVID co-production meetings. Yes. Um, I was in touch yesterday with Becky who runs it and she said that she'd be very grateful if any of the link workers could join the session. The mixed borrow session is on um, 11th of May. Um, and there are some um, section, uh, some uh, sessions uh, for certain boroughs. So if anyone interested, please do um, email me and I will um, I will connect you with Becky so you could um, be um, connected with, with the whole resource as well that they are producing as a result of this co-production sessions. Um, I participated in one of them and what I got as, um, uh, as an outcome for myself was um, some resources to share with um, with you guys and um, personal experiences that people share. But what was really nice to hear was that patients who were part of this co-production uh, meetings, I mentioned social prescribing as one of the sources that they really uh, received proper help, really appropriate support. Um, and as you said, Diana, they were mentioning that the, the possibility to be heard, to be listened to, was crucial part of the, of the recovery. Um, and, and that helped them a lot. So I think it can be also a very nice way of learning how important the role of social prescribing link worker is in this pathway, um, uh, supporting people with, with long COVID. Um, and also, Diana, you said about uh, peer support. Um, I think that is a great segue to um, our next guest speaker, Rebecca Manson-Jones from um, COVID Cafes. Um, Rebecca, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, hello. I, hello. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me. I just um, managed to catch most, I think, of, of Diana's uh, chat, which was really interesting, Diana. Um, thank you for that. I chimed a lot. Um, shall I start, Justina? Do you... Yeah. Uh, Liana, if you could move the slides. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so... Hello everyone, um, my name is Rebecca. I am a theatre director by trade and I've spent 20, 25 years working in participatory theatre where people come together to make things um, and co-design and co-production is all part of the culture. Uh, in, in March 2020 I got Covid and subsequently got long Covid, um, it turns out, and I didn't really know what it was. I just knew that in June 2020 things weren't getting better and I had a lot, I was very lucky, I am very lucky, I had a lot of support around me, but I was very conscious, and we all were in the theatre industry, that our, the freelancers and self-employed people, carers, everything was much, much more difficult. And I was thinking, well, how cracky, how are these people coping if they've got long COVID, if they're not getting better from COVID? Um, I also have a background in action learning, which is a way of bringing people together to help them um, identify, discuss, imagine ways out of questions that keep coming up and how to make change. And so um, I put together this idea that maybe we could have a COVID cafe space, which is a peer learning, a peer support place, a confidential place, a safe space away from your friends, colleagues and family, um, where people can check in, talk about stuff, maybe compare notes with other, experience, other people's experience, maybe just listen 
Um, you can be, we're, we're doing them as virtual cafes at the moment. So I invite you all to join me in the virtual cafe right now. It looks, feels, sounds exactly like your favorite cafe, the one you go to or might invent. It has drinks you can afford, particularly the ones that you like, made just the way you like them. And you come along and you attend, um, as I say, you might be in your bed, you might be sitting up at a table looking at your favorite view, you might have a notepad to hand or some craft activity that you like to do. And we meet, it's drop in, we meet over a pace of about 90 minutes, you might stay for 10 minutes, you might stay for the whole thing, you might come once and go, that was interesting, I never need to do that again. Or you might decide to sign up for a number of the series. Um, at the moment, they're very informal. Uh, we do have a second thread that we're um, planning to run, which is a group that agrees to meet on a regular basis and, and to, to do more of an action learning process, like recognising that the person you were before the pandemic, before long, uh, before long COVID or another long term condition, um, changed the way you think and do things um, and accepting where you are now and what you might be interested in doing and becoming now that this um, condition, whatever it is, has probably changed um, the way that you live. Um, one of the things that we, <clears throat> um, one of the things that we've discovered recently is that um, many people who are grappling with a long-term condition and maybe have been living with it for up to two years now in the long COVID situation, is that their friends are tired of it. Their colleagues are, 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 have done the best they can um, and maybe family too. And also those friends and, and family in particular may be mourning the loss of the friend they used to know. So um, that's why the COVID cafe space can be really valuable because you can keep talking about COVID. You can keep talking about who you are now and who you want to be now, but you can start with your friends going back to being supportive of them and friends to them because that's really important as well. Um, once you've got into the cycle of having a condition, that tends to be the thing that's front of mind and you can easily, and I know I've done this, lose touch with what friendship you can give other people. Um, and when you rediscover that, or I found when you rediscover that ability in yourself um, to be friends back to people, that, that gives you a whole load of your life back in, in tiny ways. So the COVID Cafe is a space, um, uh, a no pressure space to, uh, and at the moment they're free, to allow people to bring what they need to bring, explore what it might look like in a different way, um, and, and just kind of that feeling of going, oh, not just me then, um, and being able to be free about, um, one of the things we've explored is like guilt-free enjoyment, because um, when you're ill, uh, having fun can feel like you shouldn't be doing that or doing something that might might make you um, overdo it. Is that allowed? And kind of exploring those bar barriers for ourselves. So um, all of the people who run the or host the, the, the COVID cafes either have long COVID themselves or have another long term condition. So they might be further down the lifeline or the life cycle of a long term condition. We're all um, skilled theatre and arts uh, facilitators. We aren't there to provide therapy or recommend services necessarily. And we keep away from controversial subjects like vaccines, drugs and all of that. We're literally about how are you doing? How are you feeling? What are the things you'd like to do? And what might be the small steps to positive change? that you could start to contemplate and give yourself permission to imagine and give yourself permission to imagine things like how do I, how could I get better um, responses from health professionals? How could I ask my colleagues for other condition, uh, you know, to working conditions? How could I start explaining to family members that I just, I'm only going to come to their party for an hour, not the full six. And all of those things and just sort of start to try those conversations on for size. Um, I'm aware that I have only five minutes. Justina, am, am I kind of there on time? That's fine. That's fine. You can if anybody it. wants any questions, uh, asked to questions, that, that would be that would be fine too. Um, we're spare tire. 
You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Eventbrite, our website. The next slide's got all the details on it, I believe. Um, and our big thing is that we've run this as a trial in a, in a consortium funded by the Arts Council's Thriving Communities Fund. We are coming to the end of our funding. We want to keep it going. What we need is referrals. And if anybody's got any clues to commissionings, that'd be great. But basically, if we can demonstrate the need, it's going to be much easier, much easier for us to find the funding. Shall I stop there, Justina? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Do we have any questions to Rebecca from our link workers? Hi, okay. Rebecca. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it's Elizabeth. Uh, maybe I missed it, but um, uh, I don't think I know what your catchment area is. Um, because we're online, we don't have one. So oh. you can refer from anywhere. All right. Thank you. So this is, is completely virtual, right? Uh, it is at the moment. We were hoping to run some in-person cafes um, and we may do in the future, but in as we were bringing the um, facilitators together, it became very apparent that none of us was in any condition because of our conditions to um, guarantee to be able to offer in person at the moment. Um, uh, so we and because Om we also got going whilst Omicron was taking hold, so we thought it would be safer to offer it on online for now. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we can now move to um, the part of the session that will not be recorded. So Liana, if you could stop recording.